Hi, and welcome to the U World Order Showcase podcast. Today, we are speaking with Darcy Monet. Darcy is an old friend of mine, and she is an intuitive vocal and mindset transformation specialist. And we have this odd connection in that I live in a town that Napoleon Dynamite was filmed in, and Darcy was actually part of that movie. And I'm going to let her tell you the story <laughs> later on in the podcast. But welcome, Darcy. I'm so glad that you decided to join us. I've been wanting you on here for so long. <laughs> I know. That's my bad. I finally got off my rump and, and did what I needed to do to be on your lovely show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. So tell <laughs> us your story. How did you get into music? What, what's your background? Oh, well, if you ask my mother, <laughs> I was pretty much born singing. She likes to tell the story that when I was a baby, uh, you know how babies cry when they wake up because they have no other way of letting you know they're awake and hungry. Um, apparently, I didn't cry when I woke up, but she'd hear me like singing she'd come into the bedroom and i'd be like holding my toes and la 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 and uh so i pretty much came out singing um around 10 years old i started taking violin lessons to be in the school orchestra and they had that was when schools had music programs in the public schools uh started violin a few years later i started to learn piano and I've always sung, but begged, begged for voice lessons the whole time. And mom would be like, no, your vocal cords are still growing. No, 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 no. I think pretty much she just didn't want to pay the money. <laughs> but I finally wore her down. And at 16, we found a teacher and got me started. And then it was off to the races from there. That was my, that was the real, the thing. That was my instrument, was my voice. So then college, then bands, then studio work, and then, you know, the career. But that's how I got into music to start with. And you live in L.A., so you're kind of in mm -hmm. the the throes of all the happenings down there and <laughs> kind of, yeah. stuff going on. So You'd be surprised with? how much I don't leave my house, though. But anyway. <laughs> who does anymore? Yeah, right? I mean, like, yeah, I'm comfortable at home. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had interrupted you. What were you going to ask? That's all right. <laughs> so who are your customers? What kind of people do you do you help? Ah. And how do you help them? Well, um, as a voice coach, because I started, I've been kind of voice coaching off and on, helping friends out from my college days. But mm -hmm. about 15 years ago, I actually was like, okay, this is going to be a job, a business. Um, I my favorite students to work with are people that have natural innate talent that need to learn how to wrangle that need to learn how to control it but i also seem to attract some broken little birds who have great talent but they can't get out of their own dad gum way um with their emotional issues or past trauma that they never released or mindset or just intimidation. They're super shy or whatever. I, people that need an encouraging person in their life to cheer them on to, to step into this industry and, and really go for their dreams. So those are the people I love to work with the best people who just, you know, really who are on a career path. And then I tend to, be a little extra helpful with those who need a little more emotional help as well. Yeah, I can um, see how that would be really necessary. You've got somebody who's yeah who really is talented, but they're not really confident in their talent. Mm -hmm. Or they're just lazy. I know people who are just like complaining all the time about how they're not making a living as a musician or out here an actor, you know, as an actor everywhere you toss it. A rock, right. but um, and they just complain about it, but they don't ever actually do anything about it. They don't. They won't invest in themselves, and mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the problem a lot with a lot of people who have the the never made it uh, situation is that they they just weren't willing to take the steps they needed to take, whether it was 
healing themselves or whether it was just uh, making some sacrifices financially to be able to invest in their career, you know? So there's, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons people don't ever get there. You know, it used to be back in the day, people would just go to college and figure, Oh, I went to college. Therefore I have arrived and right. the world is my oyster. And, and to some extent that was true, mainly for mm -hmm. white males, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> when women started going to college, suddenly that wasn't such a big deal. Um, yeah. For something more than just to find a husband. Cause you know, that was the thing in the fifties mm -hmm. and early sixties when you really just needed to find mm -hmm. a guy that could support you because to support you. Yeah. It, you didn't have any other well, choice. I went to a Baptist college and that was a thing too. You went to get your MRS degree and start popping out kids. So that was very prevalent, yeah. even in the late eighties, early nineties. when I was yeah. in school. Sorry to interrupt. Continue. No, it's a thing <laughs> in the Christian communities where, you know, you, mm -hmm. you go and find your husband who's going to be a pastor somewhere. So you yep. can be a pastor's wife because it's a really big deal. That was the, the, the terror of my life. I remember praying growing up. I grew up evangelical. Mm -hmm. And just begging God, please don't call me to the mission field. Please don't call me to be a pastor's wife. I'll do anything else. <laughs> just please, none of, none of those two things. And whew, dodge that bullet. But <laughs> <laughs> by being a mouthy rock chick, I dodged that bullet. So yeah, yeah. All I have to do is be kind of mouthy and yeah. Angelica think about things, like, think out, out loud and you're in big trouble. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Yep. Yep. That's a thing. It's so funny. we connected because I live in the town Napoleon Dynamite's filmed in. Yep. And you have a curious story about that movie. <laughs> so why don't you share that? It is curious indeed. Um, so if you are familiar with the film, there is a scene early on in the movie. It's only like two or three scenes in and it's the kids in the high school and they have what's called the happy hands club. And it's some, I don't think it's actually legit ASL American sign language, but they're doing some kind of signing and they're doing it to a song that was made famous by Bette Midler called the Rose. The thing is it's not Bette singing it. It's me because <laughs> 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 For whatever reason, uh, sometimes a filmmaker, you know, they'll want to put a song in and either they won't be able to get permission from the record label to use that particular performance, like Bette's performance specifically, or here's what happens a lot of times with the labels when they don't want somebody to use their stuff, they'll quote an astronomical licensing fee that a little independent film couldn't possibly afford. So when that happens, Sometimes they'll choose to license. They might have a, a list of my backup choices, but sometimes like, no, it needs to be this song. And so they'll, that's where I come in. They'll hire a, a no name studio singer to come in and do a version of it, whether it's a sound alike or not. I, I am not a sound alike. Um, and they'll do their own thing. So the issue with, that whole thing, which should have been a really, really cool experience is that, um, you know, the day we're recording it, I signed away my right to getting paid a full SAG day rate recording session rate because it was a film license. They went with this cheaper, it's just going to festivals and stuff, a, fest, a film festival license. So I agreed to sing it for a hundred bucks. Um, not knowing as you could possibly that it would blow up like it did. The thing is I did not sign away my rights to any residuals after the fact, um, nor did any of the actors in the film. All the actors made a thousand bucks to film the whole thing. But when the, the movie blew up, they negotiated some big paychecks for them. But unfortunately, <laughs> I am not credited at the end of the film. Every piece of music and song that you hear in the film will say at the end of the film with the credits rolling, such and such song written by so-and-so publishing information, 
performed by so-and-so, except mine says The Rose, written by Amanda McBroom and whoever, sorry, I can't remember your name, publishing information, and then no performed by, it just is missing. So I never received credit. And because I wasn't a SAG member at the time, they didn't care. I filed a complaint with them, but they didn't care because I'm not a member. So never got credited, never got paid. And uh, here we are huh. 20 years later. Yeah. Wow. I know the caterers really well. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Every kid who walked across the camera in the high school scenes, their name, like there's literally a list of high schoolers and they're all there. So I just, and, and the musical director who hired me in the first place reached out to me multiple times to make sure he had my information correct because he had to have it correct for all the SAG paperwork. He had to have it correct for when they started thinking about putting a CD soundtrack together. There was a rumor that maybe I'd be able to be on the soundtrack. The Rose isn't on the soundtrack at all. They just nixed it. And the thing is, this song is so memorable. There's no dialogue over it. They're just, it's just the kids doing their hands. And it, it's a huge moment that everybody remembers when I say, oh, that scene with the hands and the sign language, they're like, oh my God. So it's, it's stupid you, that it's not even on the soundtrack. You sound just like her. I mean, really? I really thought it was her. Wow. All this time until you said, no, it's me. And you sent me over to YouTube to go listen to it. It was like, oh, my cow. Wow. It, it's it, that's funny because I don't hear it at all. My friends, of course, who have listened to me sing for years are like, you didn't even sound like her. I'm like, right? And I tried. I tried hard, but. No, um, you, you pulled it off. And you know, thank that, you. <laughs> maybe it's just me and I have, you know, tin ear, but, and, you know, I, I have earned that one, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, I guess it's good that people, I, I guess the point is that people weren't, you know, noticeably, it wasn't noticeably different, but at the same time, like when the press all came out, nobody, they kept, billing it as Bette Midler's The Rose, like the way they worded it indicated that the, what the song was and how you would know it, but they never specifically say Bette Midler singing it, but they never mm -hmm. say that it's me. And nobody, to my knowledge, no corrections were ever made, you know? I think they so just I feel intimated like they, that you, you were her and they could, mm -hmm. they were trying to ride on her coattails. They were trying to ride fame. on that. That's how I feel like it went about. I feel like they purposely made a decision at the end of the day that like, okay, we're going to leave her name out of this. And we're going to try to ride, you know, we're going to go use the loophole. And that's disgusting. You know, that's, that's not uh -huh. okay. And stories like mine are a dime a dozen in this city. And the unfortunate thing is that should have been everybody who was involved in that um, project, their careers seriously leveled up. Mm -hmm. except for mine. So what should have launched me into a career as a steadily working studio vocalist, which is what I moved to Los Angeles for, it didn't. And um, that's part of the reason I ended up coach, starting to coach, which thank God I, I love it. Um, I also think that experience has made me, you know, razor sharp. I'm always on the lookout for my own students, I'll be like, don't you sign that till I run my eyes over it. Don't you sign that, get you a lawyer. I know a lawyer, you know, I never let them just make decisions like that without being really clear on what they're getting into because. It's so easy to get sucked along, especially in places very, like Los Angeles where they're just like, yeah, there's people trying to take advantage of each other around every mm -hmm. single corner. And yeah. And it's hard to find people who are just, just really, truly good people mm -hmm. uh, that work in the industry. Cause even if they started out that way, if they reach a certain level of success, they forget where they came from and not to be a negative Nancy, but you know, there's a, I am a positive person in that there's plenty to go around. I really believe like, you know, the reason, part of the reason I didn't, 
become Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> Basically, she got my career is kind of how I look at it. What I had planned for myself was very much the trajectory she ended up on. Most of it was like, this is part of it. The reality is the, the big break I needed didn't happen. But then I let that fester inside of me. You know, I let that become an obstacle. I let that be an excuse for why this wasn't happening and that wasn't happening. That, well, if I'd been able to do this, then I could have done this, you know? So I want to take responsibility for that too. I don't want to say that this town did it because I don't want people listening to this who are maybe considering moving here to think that they can't make it because you can, but that's really more about you as a human being and what you, your outlook is, what you're putting out there. Cause what you put out there, comes right back to you. And I was putting out garbage, you know? So it is what it is. Um, but that said, if I may uh, segue into the project I'm working on now. Yeah, yeah, do that. In the last few months, I decided to take that narrative back, that I was done being a victim of Jared Hess's production company, you know, and his film. And I was going to be like, you know what? Because I, I wouldn't even talk about it for years. I wouldn't offer the information if somebody mentioned Napoleon Dynamite. I would never say, oh, by the way, did you know that's me singing the rose? I just wouldn't do it. Um, I decided to start doing that, and I do now um, when it comes up. But I also decided that, okay, so every once in a blue moon, the diehard fan <laughs> would figure out, I don't think that's really Bette Midler. And they'd go on a deep dive into the interwebs, and they'd find me, and they'd reach out and say, did you ever record I figured out that this is actually you. Did you ever record a full version of that? And I would always have to say, no, we just did the little clip for the movie, just what we needed and blah, blah, blah. Thanks for your interest though. La, la, la. And I just decided to take this narrative back. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to record a full version of this song. And literally just this morning, I met with my uh, one of my sometimes students, former co-writer, longtime friend from college, Levi Christ, who is a brilliant musician please look him up and you're welcome um he and i came up with the arrangement this morning and then one of my other students who grew up like napoleon dynamite was a huge part of his childhood and all his little bandmates because they're younger millennials um he offered he said we want to play on that record for you he goes we we would love to do this for you this would be a big deal for us please let us do it so they're going to do it and and play on it so i'm really excited uh, they're going on tour though so we have to wait till november to really put it all together but i feel really excited and i'm going to hire a pr firm and we're going to announce to the world because next year 2024 is the 20th anniversary of the film so we're gonna as a 20th anniversary celebration guess what it's me it was never bet you know that kind of thing and i'm just going to try to get myself booked at events that they put on for it, you know, to try to sing it live. I feel come to Preston. And if you do, that would be so much fun. You know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wonder if they put her, her, her record in, in poppin' pins and, and soaks and Big J burgers. <laughs> and the Big J burger is actually in Richmond. <laughs> it's down the wow. road that's in the movie. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of those places are still here and mm -hmm. businesses and mm -hmm. yeah wow are you saying these businesses have like what cds in their stores or something they could oh because these days i'm like i have no plans to print it up because nobody mm -hmm. buys tangible music anymore so well you I'm can have a QR code there and they it. can yeah scan it or something i'll call you to help me figure that out because <laughs> But yeah, so I'm really excited about it. And I and I, I had a little a little meltdown in my session with my friend Levi this morning because it just, it, I feel myself releasing this and healing, releasing the bitterness and releasing the trauma of it. And I suspect that there's going to be a lot of unexpected 
you know, breaking of the dam um, as this moves on uh, and this process happens. So I'm excited. I'm just really excited about it, but I am crowdsourcing this if I may, and you can clip this out later if you want and don't feel it's appropriate, but I am crowdsourcing this to pay for this. It's going to probably cost about $3,000 for the recording mastering and then the PR blitz. And I need that by like mid December. So look me up <laughs> Darcy with an yeah. I Monet, uh, the, uh, like paint, like the painter, the artist and uh, get in touch with me if you would like to contribute to that and I can send you the options to help with that. So like, uh, my Venmo is at Darcy Monet. Cash app is Darcy Monet. And I have Zell, but you got to get in touch with me personally for that. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. And we'll months. definitely put the links in the, in the show notes and. That'd be great. Yeah. I'll get you. I'm all message. about helping you Darcy. Cause I <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's such an important connection to me. It's like, I, I don't know why, but every time I, tell people I'm from Preston, Idaho, you know, where mm -hmm. Napoleon Dynamite was filmed. And right. the dojo was actually a Sunday school room that oh. for a Baptist church that I was teaching in. Oh, wow. So that was really fun. That's funny. I just went down a rabbit hole looking at certain scenes and, and the, the dojo scene came up um, and it just cracked me up. It's a funny movie, you know, but I haven't watched it in so long because I've been so bitter about it. <laughs> It but now I feel like I'm at a point where I'm like, I can watch this movie again now, I think, you know. There's just like so many parts of it that are just part of the town. I moved here the year mm -hmm. after it was released. Oh, and okay. So they were still doing tours and stuff like that right. when the tours came to town. Which was oh, really funny. fun. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. So when you're, when you're going to do this, how, mm. how do you actually like promote an, a song? Like, Good question. Because <laughs> when I, you know, earlier in my career, I, I've, I've put out two actual um, albums of my own CDs mm -hmm. and the world was very different than the way oh, yeah. things are. People still bought CDs or people would download stuff. Nowadays, like my, my twin nieces who are about to turn 17 uh, next month, they own their entire music catalog is in their phones. Like they don't own any CDs. They actually have a turntable and they have some vinyl records. So I'm pretty excited to go shopping for their birthday and buy them some vinyl of stuff that they absolutely need to hear, you know, like Heart and every other awesome 80s band that ever was. Um but Fleetwood Mac. I'm Fleetwood Mac for sure. Oh, I think they have they have Fleetwood Mac actually, because one of them they're twins and one of them takes lessons from me and she just sang Silver Spring by Fleetwood Mac the other day. Uh, I love it. It's really connected to that. She was singing her little face off. It was so cute and sweet. Um, but yeah, at the time, because it was unsigned, there were so a lot of resources out there for independent artists. There was a big book called the indie bible and it was updated every year and it had a whole bunch of like there was a whole section on radio stations that will play your stuff you know and it might be independent radio stations or it might be a unsigned music show for an hour once a week on whatever you know all over the country in the world or there would be a list of just like a bunch of contact PR people who deal with just independent people, but that is changed. And now that people don't use anything tangible that they hold in their hands, like this book, this indie Bible, it's hard to keep up with it, you know, I guess. Um, so I, I don't really know. And I feel, I feel terrible. I never know what to tell my students about how to get started in this industry because it's a completely different world. When I came out, you, you recorded stuff, you sold it at your shows. That's how you made your money. You sold CDs at your shows. Nowadays, you don't even make money off of downloads because everything's on Spotify. 
or Pandora or Sirius, and those three conglomerates continuously go to court and fight to pay less and less. And so you can't make money off of your streams. You can have a million downloads. Here's a good example. My friend Levi, who I mentioned earlier, we have a song that we wrote together that we kind of tongue in cheek call our quote hit because it was a song we licensed all over the place. He's the artist on it, but I'm a co-writer. So we have several million downloads of his version of that song. And I ended up recording it later myself. Several million. <laughs> I think in total, I've been paid $30 over the course of time, the years, because it's fractions of a penny if you're the artist, and it's even more fractions of a penny if you're the songwriter publisher. So millions of downloads, people probably think, oh man, they're making, no, we're not, because it's not like buying CDs anymore. I have so, an idea for you. Okay, tell me, I'll take it. I think if you could get, I think musicians that go on like YouTube and places like that, yeah. they make their money off of Google, honestly. Yeah. They get enough followers that Google pays them through AdSense. And you exactly. can make a lot of money with AdSense. But if and you same go with TikTok, to TikTok, yeah. Or you get like, um, companies will reach out to you to represent them. And if you make a video every once in a while going, oh, this great mascara I use now, you know, I'm not opposed to that, but that's basically the way now you release a single. First of all, albums are dead. Mm -hmm. the, the whole concept of 10 songs in one spot is just dumb. You can't do it anymore. We're back to a single by single society. You release a single and then you just promote the crap out of it on your social media and you do videos of you singing it in the bathtub or you do an official video and then you cut that into pieces and you put it out there in little pieces and inundate the world with it. You hope it goes viral and then you get, you can sell merchandise or then you get companies will reach out and you make your money by what little the app will pay you or what a company will pay you to partner with them and be an advertiser. And that's like, that's the way it goes now. And it's weird to me. I wonder if there aren't any groups out there that are kind of fringy, but, um, but they have a movement going on, on YouTube or on TikTok or on some mm. of these other platforms that you could reach out to or Instagram influencers or mm. musicians, people that um, would like to play your song mm. on their whatever. Yeah. So you could start like um, building, you either build your own channel mm. or you, um, yeah. They do have, there like are that. groups out there that um, will like, for instance, one of my students just got herself involved in a group of people who on Spotify, they've created a playlist of all the musicians in the group, all their songs, and then they commit to playing it all the time so that it'll bump it up. The algorithm will put it out there, put it out there, which is fine. And they've committed to there are groups out there that you can pay that will get you listed on playlists mm -hmm. um, that are popular playlists. And that's one route to go. But again, that's money out. These other groups I was just mentioning, it's just a, it's very time consuming apparently because they have rules. You have to play it this many times a week. You have to like, you have to comment and you can leave comments and hearts and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it gets to be very time consuming and, um, you know, that's that issue, but there, those, there are people, there's stuff out there. Um, but you really got to dig it up and commit to the time. And somebody like me, like maybe if you're in college and your whole life is nothing but this, you know, for me in college, my whole life was nothing but music. So um, might've been more feasible, but you know, I got adulting. I also have to do. Adulting, I hate that. It sucks. <laughs> That's why I have this background. My house is too filthy to show you my house. <laughs> today because i'm not adulting well this week but yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, a great take idea a break every now and then yeah but yeah 
ideas are out there. So a lot of it too is just finding the time to find the ways and and, and figure out the new way to people. do it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's possible. I, I have great hope for you and I can hardly wait for yes. it to come out because I think it's going to be really exciting. Me too. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, this has got, everybody has heard of Napoleon Dynamite, even though it's 20 years old, people still remember it. And I feel like that's going to be my foot in the door. You know what I mean? That gets me the attention, obviously, is that it's not just Darcy Monet releasing the next song she wrote because who's Darcy Monet? You know what I mean? So I'm excited. I'm hopeful that this will actually do something. And then, yeah. You know, and sometimes you do um, concerts on Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram and yes, TikTok. I do. Um, I have been doing face simultaneous Facebook and TikTok because I haven't quite figured out how to also do it on Instagram all at the same time. I literally will have a friend come and I I'm TikToking on their phone and then I'm <laughs> Facebooking on my phone. So I know there's probably an app out there where I can stream simultaneously to all three. I just haven't found it yet. But yeah, I do Facebook live concerts. Um, Cause in this town also, it's so expensive to play live cause you got to play your band, pay your band. And then it's, you know, it's a $20 to get in the door for your friends and then they have to buy two drinks or food. And then there's 15 to $20 parking. There's gas, which is already, it's like a hundred dollar night to ask, my friends or supporters to come see me and i don't want people who just need a blessing to miss out on that so i got started doing facebook lives during lockdown because well, there were nothing else to do and i was like well now i've got a captive audience now you have to listen to me and i just kept up with it because i it, it give, it's because it gives me it, it feeds my soul to do them and to fall back in love with singing again which I had definitely fallen out of love with. And so um, it's really fun. So yeah, if you find me on the Facebooks and on the TikToks, um, I'm Darcy Monet on TikTok. I am Darcy Smith Monet on Facebook. But if you connect me with me there, then you can um, definitely catch my lives. And they are fun. I, I really enjoy watching them. I appreciate that you have done so. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, Darcy, is there one thing you want to leave the audience with today? Oh, just stay true to yourself no matter what you're doing. Know who you are. Find out who you are, what you believe in, what your passion is, and then keep doing that whether you decide to do it as your job try to do it as your job or just because you do it because you love to do it the you i really believe that when you put something out there and you make a decision i'm doing this the universe conspires with you to make it happen and to build it up and for a lot of people that can become the difference between their hobby that they love and and their career path so I would say, know yourself, stay true to yourself, and just do what you love to do. And nothing but good can come of it. So true. So true. And you never know, the connections that you make along the way mm -hmm. can like totally turn your life around yeah. 180 so that you're, you're, you're going in a direction that you never even thought was possible, yeah. but really the universe is good and I does agree. inspire oh, to help us. well that reminds me the one of the guys from napoleon dynamite he was he was the one that dated la fonda what was <laughs> ah i can't kip kip i think his character's name was he was the one that talked like this all the time and <laughs> he because this film had no here's an example this is why i'm interrupting again here's an example of what it might not turn out the way you thought it was going to, but you're going to maybe find your passion in a different, a different passion that works out mm -hmm. for you. He was in this film, fabulous actor, um, but they didn't have a budget obviously. And they needed to take stills on the set. You know, that's part of the process, the process of making films, taking just still shots. He was an amateur photographer. So he did it. What ended up happening is that, out of these still shots, he got 
called by other films and companies to take photographs of him. So he's now he's this photographer and has this huge career as a photographer and he loves it. And it's all because of this little film that he was acting in. And he thought that's what he wanted to be when he grew up, but it what took a different direction and he's perfectly happy. So you never know to be open to things that might curveball and still be just as much fun. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And maybe you're, Coaching is because you're supposed to be coaching and not a famous Absolutely. studio singer because somebody yeah. out there is going to be famous because they ran into you. That's the point. Yeah, that's it. I know I'm called to do this and I'm, and I'm perfectly happy with that. It's good. Yeah. You're so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today, Darcy. I really appreciate your time and, and your talent. Thank you. Just for being you. You're so cool. Oh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it.